So just, just a couple words about myself before we get into the presentation. Um, I, my name is Heidi Cass, and I am the co-founder um, of the Rochester Seed Library. A, a friend and myself brought the idea to this library staff a um, little over three years ago, and well, actually four years ago, because it took us a year to get it off the ground. Um, and it has been just a tremendous opportunity for me to be involved with this project. Um, it's succeeded all of my expectations so much. It's just a fantastic project and we're very, very proud of it and very happy to have it in our community. And one of the things that we are working very hard on is community outreach and community education to get people growing gardens and also to educate them on how to save their own seeds for their own purposes and also to share back to the library if they can. So this is uh, one and a number of different classes that we've offered. Um, the other classes that have been um, recorded prior will be found on our website. Um, and this one will join it there um, as soon as they can get that figured out. I don't know, a week or two, I would suspect. So um, I am not a, a professional gardener. I am not a master gardener. I'm a self-taught gardener, a kind of a garden obsessed person <laughs> and um, consider myself to be rather a gardening um, activist. So it's, it's a passion of mine and I'm very happy to be with you here tonight. I'm really glad to see you here. And I welcome all your questions. I will um, stop at various points to see if anyone wants to pose a question. You can do that you know, through the chat or if you want to um, ask, that's fine. And then at the end, we should have time for questions as well. I also, um, again, want to reiterate there, there is a lot of information in this presentation. Uh, please don't feel like you have to just frantically take lots of notes because this will be available to you online to review later if you'd like to do so. And with that, I will see if I can share my screen and get our presentation up on the screen here. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, on the screen, I say plan a garden for seed saving. Sometimes it says plant a garden for seed saving. The two are really inner changeable, they really mean the same thing. So um, let's not get too worried about that. It's the same class that I've done for community ed the last couple of years. So, And really the focus of the class tonight is just to um, have you take away the idea that if you are growing your garden for vegetables alone, you're really missing a huge part of the potential that your garden has because you can create and grow a whole nother crop from your garden. And that of course is the seeds that you can use for future crops. So we wanna make sure you're getting the absolute most production and value out of that garden that you can. And tonight we're gonna to learn how you can uh, get really good at seeds. So first of all, let's just go over a few uh, reasons why you would wanna grow and save your own seeds. You know, first of all, one of the first things that people think about is saving money. Seed packets um, range from you know two fifty to four dollars each. Um, sometimes, if they're organic, they might be more than that. Um, if you're ordering them online, you're probably paying shipping fees. And so, if you're ordering seeds every year or maybe every other year for your garden, those costs can really add up quickly. Um, if you're purchasing plants at a, a garden center, it will add up even more quickly. So growing your own seeds can really save you a lot of money over the years. Um, convenience, having seeds on hand right there at home when you are ready to plant them is also super convenient. No shopping, ordering, and waiting. And as we all know, um, in the time of COVID, um, it can be really difficult to even source seeds uh, the specific seeds you want, um, if you know uh, seed companies are running low or they're backlogged, uh, or they're um, you know, just out of seeds altogether. So when you've got them at home, uh, you've got seeds. You don't have to worry about finding them somewhere else. One thing that a lot of people don't realize is that when you grow plants, save seeds, 
and then do that year after year in your own home garden, what you're actually doing is creating a, a strain of that particular vegetable that is adapted to your growing conditions, to your soil and to your climate or sub um, microclimate in your yard. So you're actually going to have more and more success um, potentially as years go by, as you continue to select the best fruits and save the best seeds and continue to plant them in your own yard and create this locally adapted um, strain for your conditions. Um, food insurance, uh, that kind of goes along with what I said earlier about convenience, that you will have a seed cash um, that helps protect you against seed scarcity, but also food scarcity. Um, you know, again, thinking about the pandemic, um, those early months, there were definitely foods that were very scarce on the shelves. And, um, you know, it really got people thinking about our food system and, you know, how secure it is, how reliable it is. Um, gardens and saved seeds really help you have some food insurance against that. Um, I consider saved seeds to be an asset, um, almost like a currency. They're wonderful for trading and swapping um, with friends or neighbors or um, anyone in the community. Um, you know, everyone's heard of seed swaps and it's always nice to go to a seed swap bringing something with you to contribute. So. Um, think of them as uh, a little type of currency and um, you can either, you know, swap or just, just give them away. And that certainly feels really good too. Um, saving your own seeds is also great for the environment. Even if the seeds that you would purchase online are organic seeds, remember that they're probably using machinery to grow those seeds. They are packaging those seeds in machinery that uses energy, they have facilities that use energy. They truck those seeds all over the country or ship them all over the country. Then you have to, um, you, know, you might have to go to the store using your own car to get seeds. You eliminate all of those pieces of transportation, all of those mechanized processes if you are saving your own seeds right there on your own property. So it's really environmentally friendly. A couple other reasons that you want to save seeds. Um, when you allow your vegetables in your garden to go to flower and then to go to seed, you're actually helping produce uh, food for pollinators because you're, you're bringing more flowers into your garden. So it's, it's great for pollinators. Um, it's also can become a really fun hobby. Uh, some people, if they really get interested in it, um, you know, really get dedicated to saving the absolute best, maybe creating their own crosses, uh, maybe selecting for specific flavors or colors or sizes, and, and it really becomes a fun hobby for them. Uh, the other thing that uh, might happen in your family is um, if you have a food that you're growing in your garden and you're growing it year after year after year, you're developing recipes and traditions around that food as a part of your family's food culture, that really becomes part of your family's story. And we'll talk a little bit later about the word heirloom and what that means, but um, heirlooms, um, you can develop your own heirloom really for your own family. Uh, and, and like I mentioned earlier, um, you could share your seeds with the seed library. There are some varieties and types of vegetables that produce an enormous quantity of seed and you know, more than any average gardener would need in multiple years. So um, even just saving seeds from a few plants would give you plenty to donate to the library. So uh, we hope that you will consider doing that. And in the end, um, it's really fun and really rewarding. Um, I think if you try it, you will you'll be surprised at how rewarding it really is to start saving your own seeds. So we're not gonna get into a lot of scientific jargon in this presentation, but there are a few terms that is important for you to understand. And so two of them are here on the screen. The first one is the word species. And I think that 
generally people understand what the word species means when it's related to the animal kingdom. So, you know, that a lion is a species I'm a tiger, for example. Um, but when it comes to plants, I think people get a little bit more confused about what that word means. So, scientifically, what it means, the species is a group of similar organisms that are able to interbreed. And um, for plants, what that means is that these, this group of plants is exchanging pollen, um, the male flowers and the female flowers, in order to produce viable seed. A species is indicated by using a Latin name called binomial because there are two words in that Latin name. The first word is called the genus and the second word is actually called the species name. And the example I have there, Dacus carota, that is the scientific name for carrot. And scientific names are always written that way with the first word being capitalized and the second word not capitalized and it is generally in italics. So when you see something like that in a seed catalog or in a book or something, um, you'll know that you're looking at the Latin name and it is referring to a species of plant. So carrot is a species of plant. Now, how is that different from variety? So variety is a unique variation within a species. And really, this is something that has evolved from human interference in plants through selective breeding. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, people who get interested in plants and wanting to produce better and better food may be selecting um, for flavor or for color or for size or for hardiness or for all sorts of different genetics uh, variations that exist within a particular species. And the more they select for that, eventually you get something that's quite different from the original. And we can call that a variety. It's still the same species, but it has characteristics that are unique enough that we call it a, a variety. And so when we have something like that, um, it's written as I'm showing there at the bottom, the species name plus in quotation marks, the variety name. And so in this case, we're showing the how Danvers carrots would be written, um, Danvers being the variety of carrot that we're referring to here. So I've got a little quiz that we're going to run through. Normally, I give this um, presentation in person, so it's a little bit easier through raising hands and things like that, but we'll try to uh, just kind of quiz you um, you can think about about what's happening here on the screen and see if you can get the idea of species and varieties down really solidly in your head. So the pictures on the screen here are all different types of beans, clearly. Um, they each uh, look a little bit different, um, but just by looking at them, by the pictures you're seeing on the screen, I want you to ask yourself, are all of these plants the same species? or not, so kind of formulate an idea in your head. And I'm gonna help you a little bit by showing you the names of these plants. We've got a runner bean, a cow pea, the ideal market bean, which is one of the ones from the seed library, and a lima bean. So again, I don't know if this helps you or not to decide whether these are the same species. The only way we would really know for sure is by looking at the Latin name. So let's take a peek at this. The Latin names, and as you can see, they are all different. Now, three out of the four have the same genus name, Phaseolus, but the second word, the species name, is different in all of those cases. And so, what we've got here are four different species of plants. Your beans are a different species from your typical green bean, lima beans are another species, and so are cow peas. Because they're all different species, the question is, can they cross pollinate? Can they produce viable seed by sharing their pollen? Can they interbreed? Because they're different species, the answer is no. 
because different species cannot interbreed with each other. So these cannot cross. And if you had all four of these plants growing in your garden, they could not cross pollinate each other. You would not get crossing. You would not get um, some kind of a hybrid coming out of this because they're all different species. Let's look at another example. So this is beans again. And again, they look quite different from each other. Different colors, different shapes. Um, by looking at this picture, are you able to decide whether these are different species or the same species? The names uh, may or may not help you. Um, we've got the dragon's tongue, um, a wax bean, um, a purple bean, and the lazy white bean. So, Unless you're an expert on bean varieties, uh, those, those names probably aren't going to help you. The only way you're going to know, again, is by knowing what the uh, Latin name or the scientific name for these are. Here, in this case, these are all Phaseolus vulgaris. These are all the same species. They're all called common bean. And what you're seeing in front of you are just variations or different varieties of the same plant. And so can they cross in the garden? Theoretically, yes, because they're all the same species. They could cross pollinate with each other. Now, what we're going to find out a little bit further down the road tonight is that that's very unlikely um, because beans are a self pollinating plant, but there is that possibility. So you want to be aware of that. Let's go through an example with squash. Here we've got um, four very different looking plants, different colors, shapes, sizes. Are they the same species or not? Let's look at their names. Um, the Rondini squash, a pumpkin, we've got a zucchini, and we've got an acorn squash. But unless you're an expert, they're so different different names, different colors, it's very tempting to say that these plants are all different species. Looking at the scientific names, they are not. These are all cucurbita pipos. That is a species of squash. And these are just variations of that one species. They are varieties of the same species. And so can they cross? They absolutely can cross with each other because they are the same species. And this would be a real problem in your garden if you had two or more of these growing um, and you wanted to save seeds, you would have a big issue because they could be cross pollinating. One last example, again, in the squash family, again, with a fruit that looks very, very different from each other. Um, Let's look at the names here and see if that at all. We've got a, um, a petty pan, uh, we've got a Hubbard squash, a crookneck squash, and a silver edge squash. Um, it's really not giving us a lot of information, so let's look at the scientific names. Now, in this case, they are all different species. Um, we've got a cucurbita pipo, just like we had in the prior slide, but we've also got three other varieties of squash here. In this case, because they are all different species, these would not cross with each other. And so the basic idea is that it is very important for you to know what you're planting in your garden. And actually, in many cases, it's really important to know the scientific name, because unless you know that, you really can't be sure what's going to be happening with cross pollination. The two other important um, terms that we should go over are open pollinated and hybrid. So open pollinated plants um, will produce seed that is true to type. And what that means is that if you take the seeds of the plant and plant them the next year, you're going to get uh, a resulting plant growing that will be identical to the parent. I mean, there may be some slight variations, just as you know, there are slight variations from mother to child, um, but they are the same plant. 
um, the open pollinated seeds that you purchase are the result of intentionally preventing cross pollination with other varieties. They're, they're doing what they need to do to keep that particular variety uh, pure and free of crossing with other things. So that's open pollinated. That's kind of the, the umbrella term for um, plants that will grow true to type. But underneath that umbrella term, the word heirloom is often used. And that is kind of a subgroup. It's, it's the open pollinated varieties that have a history. They've typically been grown and shared for generations in a community or a family. Now there's no specific hard and fast definition to the word heirloom. Uh, some people think that a seed has to be over 50 years old or maybe over 100 years old, or sometimes they say even just 25 years old. So it's really a matter of opinion. Um, but generally, heirloom refers to seeds that have a story, that have a history, and that um, are very integral to a community or to a family. So now compare that to the word hybrid. Um, a hybrid seed, and I'm sure you've all heard of hybrid seeds, these are seeds that are intentionally crossed. It's one variety is um, the, the mother plant and one variety is the father plant, and they are intentionally crossed to create uh, the next generation that has some of the best qualities of each of those parents. Um, many times hybrids are referred to as F1 plants, and that just means first generation. And, you know, there are a lot of um, good things you can say about hybrid plants because they are many times grown to um, help with pest and disease resistance. But a lot of times, too, they can lose um, some of their flavor and some of their nutrition if they are hybridized more for the commercial market, more uh, based on how they're able to ship and things like that. So um, hybrid seeds, um, because they are hybridized, if you save the seeds from those plants and plant them the next year, you're not going to get the same thing. You're not going to get a true to type um, plant coming from that. So essentially, you're kind of stuck buying seeds every year if, if what you want to grow is that particular um, hybrid variety. So again, if you are wanting to save seeds in your garden, you have to make sure you're starting with an open pollinated variety or an heirloom variety so that you can be sure that those seeds that you save are gonna produce what you want the next year. So before I move any further um, on that, is there any questions that I want you want me to answer related to clarifying any of that? Nothing. Okay, then we will move on. So it's really important um, to start with good seeds. Um, if you plan to save seeds from your garden, um, there are quite a few really great seed companies out there that um, specialize in open pollinated and heirloom seeds. Order a few catalogs and receive those um, in the mail. The things that you might want to look for are, you know, does that catalog provide you with the Latin name of the plant? Does it tell you very clearly whether that plant that you're considering is open pollinated or, or hybrid? Does it give you a really good description of the plant's characteristics and flavor? And sometimes they will also give um, information about disease resistance, and that's very helpful information as well. I've listed here um, just a few of some of the most well-known seed companies um, that specialize specifically in open pollinated and heirloom seeds. Um, probably most of you are familiar with Seed Savers Exchange, which is um, just down in Decorah, Iowa, and they are world famous for their efforts to um, preserve lots and lots of heirloom varieties. They're a wonderful organization, but these other companies also have fantastic quality seeds. 
Um, and then I've also listed down below some seed companies that have a combination of open pollinated and hybrid seeds available for sale. This is just a snapshot of a picture out of the territorial seed catalog. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here that you might look for when you're looking to purchase seeds. Um, up at the top, I have circled the scientific name that they're giving us and they've got um, formatted just like I mentioned. Um, that is the name for all of the, the plants on this page. It's the Latin name for radish. And then they've also indicated under each variety name, whether it's a hybrid by indicating F1 or whether it's open pollinated. So it's very, very clear uh, which ones are open pollinated here. Very helpful, good information. Okay, so now you've got your seeds and you're going to start planting, you're going to start planning this. One of the things that you really need to be somewhat aware of is how your plants pollinate. And you have to be able to control this pollination process in order to, going to have um, good seed. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we're going to go through the three basic pollination methods so you have a grasp of what those three are. First one here is wind pollination. And probably the most famous or well-known crop that is pollinated by the wind is corn. Um, you've got pictures here of both the male flower at the top, the corn tassel, and then the female flower, which is the ear of corn, and those silks that come out of the ear, the immature ear, are all the female parts of, of the flower. Um, so one corn plant has both male at the top, the tassel, and female down below at the ear. And the pollen is so fine and so small that it is carried by the wind around um, in the air and it lands on those silks. And that is what pollinates the ear and causes all the kernels on the ear to grow. Um, because we live in corn country, um, it is quite a task to grow corn of some open pollinated variety and save seed. You really have to take some really strong precautions because corn uh, pollen can actually be carried um, up to two miles on the air. So for the sake of this presentation, we are not gonna go into any details about how you would do that. Um, but there are certainly you know, videos and books and things out that would, would go into information about that. Another example of a wind pollinated plant that you might grow in your garden is spinach. Um, few people know this because we seldom let spinach go to seed or even go to flower. You know, if you're growing spinach in your garden, as the season progresses, it will bolt which is what we call when the, the plant starts to produce a flower stalk. And that's when the leaves start to get a little bit bitter and the production goes down. And usually we just pull the plant out and it's done for the year. But if you were to let that plant go and continue on with its life cycle, it would send up its flower stalk. And if you look closely, you would be able to see that each individual spinach plant is either a male or a female plant. The picture that we've got here on the screen is a female spinach plant, and those little white fingers are parts of the female flower. The male plants produce pollen just like corn does, and the female plants um, get that pollen as it swirls through the air. Um, and so for wind pollinated vegetables like spinach, if you are interested in saving spinach seed, it's important to grow spinach in clumps. You don't wanna grow a single long row of individual spinach plants. It would be much better to grow spinach in a block. So maybe 10 plants by five plants, for example, if you wanted to grow that much because 
the wind pollination will, will work better if you've got plants in a small area. There's more likely more pollen in, in a condensed area to hit those female flowers. So if you know that the plant you're growing and you want to save seeds from is a wind pollinated plant, one of the things you need to think about in planning is to grow that plant in blocks. Okay. The other thing to consider is um, even with spinach, that that pollen can be taken by the wind. And so if you're the only one in your area that is saving spinach seed, you probably don't need to worry. If you've got a neighbor who's just as interested in seed saving as you are, and you're both trying to do spinach, and you're each doing a different variety, I know the chances of this are very slim, <laughs> but I'm talking about worst case scenario, then you would need to worry. But if you're both growing the same variety, no worries. Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right, let's move on to insect pollination. Um, so this is very, very common, uh, is, the, is the method of pollination uh, for squash, for cucumbers, for melons, um, also for things like radishes and what I'm calling brassicas. Not familiar with that term, brassicas are a huge group of vegetables that include things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, turnips, uh, there's just a huge number of varieties that are all um, in this group called brassicas, and they are also insect pollinated. And insect pollination, uh, generally there are male flowers and female flowers, and insects are moving back and forth between these large open flowers to exchange pollen. Um, so the easy way to quote, control this, because you really can't control the insects doing the pollination, is to just make sure that you're only growing one variety of a species. So, for example, if you are growing cucumbers and you want to save seeds from cucumbers, only grow one variety. And I think, you know, in most gardens, that's pretty normal anyway. Um, but it's possible that people would say, I want to grow a pickling cucumber and I want to grow a slicing cucumber. And if that's what you're doing, you've got two different varieties there and you can have issues with cross pollination so that you have to take some further steps to control it. But again, if you're only growing one, um, then you're fine. Just let the insects do their work and you can collect your seeds at the end of the, the growing season. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of how you could control this if you were growing more than one variety, um, we'll go over hand pollination really quickly. It may seem a little bit complicated, but actually it's very, very simple and it's really a lot of fun. Um, so the pictures down there at the bottom of the screen are of a squash variety, it's actually butternut squash. The first picture is the male flower before it's opened. And if you look at the stem underneath the blossom, you'll see that the stem is very straight and it's the same thickness all the way down. But next to it is the female flower. And the female flower underneath the blossom has an immature fruit that actually looks um, much like the mature fruit will look. It's the same shape. It's like a tiny little butternut squash. And so that's how you can tell the difference between the male and the female flowers. That's the case in all squashes um, where the stem will be either skinny and straight or, or have the immature fruit. And if you're trying to hand pollinate your squash because you have, for example, let's go back to the quiz. And if you remember in the quiz, there was a pumpkin and a zucchini that were the same species. There were cucurbita people. It's very likely that there are people who would want to grow pumpkins and would want to grow zucchini in the same garden, and they may want to save seeds from both of those. But if they don't do something um, special to, to prevent cross-pollination by insects, they're not going to be able to save those seeds. So what you would need to do is in the evening, 
or very, very early morning before a blossom opens up, you would go out and um, you bag it. Um, you bag that female flower and the male flower. And then go back either the next morning or a few hours later when that flower has opened. And then you can um, pick the male flower right off the plant and then take it right over to a female flower that you have bagged. Peel the, the petals off that male flower, revealing that part on the inside that's covered with pollen, as you're seeing in that third picture. Then open up the male or the female flower very carefully. Just kind of uh, swirl that all that pollen around inside there. And then peel that female flower back up. And you can either do that with um, a clothespin or um, I actually use little um, organza party bags, and I'll show you pictures of that um, further down the road here that slip right over that blossom and then have, you know, drawstring that, that holds it on there real tight. And you would just leave that bag or the clothespin or whatever is holding that flower shut. You'd leave that on there until that fruit starts to develop. And then once the fruit is developed, you can remove all of that because it can no longer be cross-pollinated with anything else. Um, but really what you're trying to do is just keep the flowers covered or closed or bagged until you can do the pollination yourself and then rebag them again until the fruit starts to develop and then you're off and running and you know you've got a fruit that's going to be pollinated only by the flowers of its own variety. You want to tie a little bit of string or ribbon or something around that uh, stem of that fruit so that you can find it later at the end of the season because that's the one you want to save your seeds from. And you really, um, you know, should have flowers around your vegetable garden. Uh, a lot of vegetable gardeners are also flower gardeners, so this usually isn't a big problem. But if, I encourage you to think about flowers in the actual garden or around other places in your yard, because as many, uh, the more um, insects you can draw into your garden area, the better pollination you're going to get on your vegetables as well. So think about plants that have a wide range of bloom times all the way from spring, early spring to late fall, and just incorporate those in your yard and you'll see the benefits in your vegetable garden as well. All right, the third type of pollination is self-pollination. And this is the case in things like beans, peas, lettuce, and tomatoes. And what self-pollination means is that the flower that grows actually already has both the female and the male parts inside of it. And it's rather closed up. And so all the pollination takes place right inside the flower before it opens. And insects are not involved um, in the process at all. So they pretty much take care of their own pollination. And this makes these particular vegetables some of the easiest to save seeds from. You don't have to worry about bagging anything generally. Um, it's very, very simple. Because of that also, um, you can grow more than one variety in your garden and not worry about cross-pollination. So they generally recommend 10 feet apart um, just to be on the absolute safe side, but that's generally not too much of a problem for people um, with gardens. So if you wanted to, for example, grow um, a yellow wax bean, but you also wanted to grow a purple potted pole bean, and those are the same species, you can grow those in your garden, give them about 10 feet of space, and then that's all you really have to worry about. Uh, peas are another example. If you wanted to grow like a sugar snap pea, but you also wanted to grow a shelling pea, again, you can do that. Just separate them from each other by at least 10 feet, and then that's all you have to do 
Um, so when you're planting your garden, you want to lay out your plants in that way. Now, at the bottom here, I am showing a picture of a bag, and this is that little organza party bag that I mentioned, and they do come in different sizes. You can get them at craft stores, you can order them online, and they're very handy for seed saving. Um, the tomato is a self-pollinating plant. However, on a rare occasion, you will have um, the male part kind of extend out of that flower a little bit. And so it's possible that you could get cross pollination. You know, if you're a professional commercial seed grower, that's maybe something for you to worry about. As a home grower, I don't think it's, it's that much of a worry for you. Um, again, I would just suggest if you're growing different varieties of tomatoes that you give them at least 10 feet of separation in your garden. Um, if you're at all concerned about it, though, you can use these little bags. So before the tomatoes open, the tomato flowers, you put the bag around a cluster of those flowers. And then once the little tomatoes start to develop, then you can just take the bag off and mark that little cluster. And those are the tomatoes that you would save your seeds from. If you want to be super cautious, you can do it that way. So a few other things to be thinking about in the planning process. There are plants that are going to require more space in your garden if you're letting them go to seed. And I guess that makes sense because the plant um, that you eat is just, you know, the base the, the base leaves. And if you're going to let it go to seed, it has to put up a flower stalk, it has to create flowers and then seed pods and all these other features. So two examples of this would be lettuce and radishes. Um, lettuce is actually in the same family as dandelions. You can see the yellow flowers there look a little bit like tiny little dandelion flowers. Um, one lettuce plant will produce this great big flower head that you see in the picture and will produce a ton of seed. So if you want to save seed from lettuce, one plant is going to give you enough seed for years to come. Two or three plants are going to give you enough seed to donate to everyone you know, plus the seed library. So lettuce is a great one um, for beginning seed savers because it is one of these self-pollinating plants. Radishes, you'll see the picture there a little bit to the right. They also take up a lot of space once they've gone to seed. They become quite bushy and quite unruly. Um, what you're seeing in that picture, sort of the purplish colored things, those are the seed pods. And radish seed pods are actually edible and really yummy uh, before they get dry and hard and before the seeds are fully mature. But when they're green and young, um, you can have a second crop from your radishes by eating the seed pods and they are, they're really, really good. Great in salads or just snacking right out of the garden. Um, so in the case of lettuce, as I mentioned, that is self-pollinating. So there is very little concern about giving it lots of space. Radishes, on the other hand, are not. They are insect pollinated, and so they need separation between different varieties. So if you are growing more than one radish um, for seed, you would need to really be concerned about that. But if you're just growing one variety, which I think is probably would be more typical, then you don't need to worry about it. Um, in my garden, for example, I grow a couple different varieties, but I'm only letting one of those varieties go to seed each year. And because it produces so much seed, I don't even have to do it every year. Um, so it's very easy to just grow, you know, one for fresh eating and then the other for seed. And the other thing to think about is the time that these plants will take in the garden. So for some types of vegetables, we pick the fruit really when it's immature. 
um, the market maturity is not the same as its seed maturity or the stage at which the seeds are ready. So a good example of that is cucumbers. Um, in the picture there at the top, you can see three cucumbers. One of them, the green one, is how we would pick it to eat it. And it's actually quite immature. The seeds are very small and soft and undeveloped inside. And that's really preferable. Um, if you've ever eaten a cucumber that has great big developed seeds inside, it's just not a good experience. But if you want to save some seeds from your cucumber, you need to let the cucumber stay on the vine until it changes color and stops changing color. Um, and in this case, with the Suyu Long cucumber, and this is one of the varieties from the seed library, it turns yellow um, when it's finally completely mature. You want to leave those on the vine even a little bit longer than you think you need to. Um, maybe a week or two past when it stops changing color. And then you can pick that uh, fruit and then you can harvest the seeds from it and they will be large and they'll be hard and they'll be they'll be good to know. And that's going to take a lot longer in the garden than just you know picking it to eat it. So you might want to identify a cucumber early in the season that you want to leave go to seed. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So peas are another example. Um, clearly, if you're going to save seed, you need <coughs> to let them dry completely, <coughs> and they're going to turn brown <coughs> and um, look like the picture below. And that's going to take a lot more time than if you were picking them to eat them. Um, as immature seeds or as immature pods. And then, of course, there are plants that don't even produce seeds in their first year. And these are called biennials. Oh, two more terms for you. An annual and a biennial. So a plant that completes its life cycle in one growing season is an annual. Um, the number of days needed for that plant to grow from seed, produce a flower, and then go to seed uh, vary depending on um, you know, what, what type of plant it is. And that's why some uh, garden plants need to be started indoors and others can be planted outdoors because they have varying um, lengths of you know, their life cycle. So examples of annuals are listed there. It would be the tomatoes, the peppers, lettuce, radishes, eggplant, squash. There's a, a lot of them. A lot of um, garden vegetables are annuals. And so these are things that you can harvest seed from in one year, right out of your garden the very first year that you plant it. But then there are plants that actually require two years to produce seed. They need two years to complete their life cycle. In the first season, they grow vegetation. And this is typically what we eat. It grows the vegetable that we eat. But then in the second season, it goes on to produce its flower stock and its flower and its seed. And examples of that would be kale, cabbage, beets, carrots, onions, um, most things that are in the brassica family are biennials. And um, so these would be the ones that take the most of your time. In other words, they take two years in order to get seed from them. You really have to plan ahead if you're going to try to get seed from these. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment, but I just want to mention um, population size. And, you know, I don't want to go too much into this. Um, this is really more of a concern, not for beginners, but for people who are either really serious about maintaining a variety well into the future or people who are, um, you know, growing for commercially or something like that. 
And the idea here is that it's important to have a large enough population of plants that are interbreeding with each other to create good genetics within your seed. So some of the um, things listed here, for example, beans and peas, in order to have a good variety of genetics within your seeds, it's suggested that you grow five to 10 plants and save seeds from five to 10 plants. That generally is not a problem um, for gardeners because most gardeners, if they're growing beans, are going to grow, grow many more than that. So that's not really an issue. But when you look at, for example, radishes, um, not many gardeners are probably going to save the seed from 20 to 50 radishes. That would produce thousands and thousands of seeds and take up quite a bit of space in the garden. So um, here it says that you know five are needed for viable seeds. And so that's important to, to understand that you have to have enough uh, flowers, particularly for insect pollinated plants in order to get a lot of um, genetic diversity within those seeds. So um, I guess I wouldn't get too hung up on this, but it is something to keep in the back of your mind to ask yourself, you know, if I wanna get really good seed, how many plants do I want to have going to seed at one time? And um, keep in mind too that you don't have to save seed from everything. Alluded to this in that if you save seeds from lettuce for one year, you're gonna have seed probably for the next five years, as long as they're viable, um, because it produces a lot. And most seeds, if they're stored properly, um, will be good for up to five. There are some plants that tend to have shorter shelf lives. Carrots and onions are sort of those that are mentioned frequently. But again, it you really, I mean, it really depends on the conditions you're storing them in. And um, it's really hard to say with any certainty how long or short the, the life of your seeds might be. Um, and I've kind of covered some of this already. Um, one butternut squash can produce 160 seeds. So if you save you know, even seed from one squash, you're going to have seeds for years to come. Um, so let's move on. All right, I wanna do a little bit of uh, an exercise with you. And just take a moment to think about your garden space, whether it's one that you have already established or one that you want to establish or are thinking about for the future, try to, in your head, think about how large it is, what kind of distances you've got there. For and then I also want you to think about if you could only grow three vegetables in your garden, what would they be? What are your top three favorite vegetables that you just absolutely um, would want to grow. Um, think about that for just a, a minute and then we will move on. All right. So I'm going to have most of the garden uh, plants that we grow categorized into three different categories. And the very first one is easy. And I'm hoping that um, at least one of the vegetables that were in your top three are listed here under easy. And if so, I would really encourage you to think about trying to save seed from that this year. So the easy ones are the beans, the peas, the tomatoes, and lettuce. Those are the self-pollinating. We've got the spinach, which is the wind pollinated. You don't have to do much, the wind takes care of it. And then a few others I've listed there as easy. Um, I've put them in this category either because they are self-pollinating or because typically gardeners only grow one variety. So um, dill, for example, um, 
I don't know I've ever heard of anyone growing more than one variety of dill at one time. Um, and uh, cilantro is another good example of that. Um, and if you do grow more than one of some of these, um, you will need to worry about, you know, the hand pollinating or the isolation distances. But in general, if people are only growing one, one watermelon variety or one radish variety, then it's very, very easy. You just let nature do its thing and you collect the seeds at the end of the season. Um, also on this list here are three from that brassica group that um, are annuals. And so they would be very easy to grow as well. So mustard greens, bok choy, and broccoli. So those are the easies. And then the middle category here, I'm calling easy with precautions. And all that really means is generally they're pretty easy to save seeds from, but you may have to take some precautions uh, because um, they might need to be bagged um, if you're growing more than one variety, et cetera. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the peppers in a moment. Um, But right here. Um, and so this is a picture of a pepper flower. And it's a very wide open flower. The insects love them. Peppers are actually self pollinated. They don't need insects at all to produce fruit. But because they're so open, the, the insects are drawn to them. So this is an example of a self pollinating plant that you will want to bag the flowers in order to keep the insects away if you are growing more than one variety. And I think, you know, that does happen. Um, it's pretty common for gardeners to want to grow a hot pepper and then also a sweet bell pepper. So if that's the case in your garden and you're hoping to save seeds, you would want to take precautions by bagging either the flower itself before it opens um, or bagging the entire plant, as you can see in the picture down below. There are <clears throat> special bags that are available. I know they sell them um, online through Seed Savers Exchange, where you can actually bag an entire pepper plant and uh, leave that bag on there until it develops peppers. And then once the peppers are on there, take the bag off, tag those with a little piece of string or yarn or something, and then um, save seeds from the ones that you have tamed. The one thing I find though, and I have, I have done this, I have tried this technique and surprisingly, um, you're going to get much less fruit set if you bag the plant like that. And the reason is because pollination is really aided by movement, movement of the flower. So even though pepper plants don't require insects, when an insect comes along and buzzes around on that flower, it is aiding the flower to pollinate itself by moving its own pollen. And so if you eliminate the insects from your plant, though the plant doesn't, um, it doesn't set as much fruit. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. You could actually go around and shake the plants slightly, um, and that would help. I have a, a pepper plant that I dug out of my garden last fall, put it into a pot, and brought it into the house to overwinter. This was an experiment that I wanted to try to see if I could get it to survive until the following spring. And what I ended up doing, because I was noticing that the the flowers weren't setting very much fruit. But after a while, I started going around and basically tickling the flowers. Every time a flower opened, I was wiggling it and tickling it with my fingers just to get the pollen to move around a little bit on the flower. And suddenly I had all kinds of peppers on that plant. So um, just a little tip if you are trying this technique um, to keep that in mind. All right, and then the last category I'm going to call challenging for seed saving, and um, these are all biennial plants. 
So these are the ones that require a second year in the garden in order to um, create seed. Challenging part is keeping those plants alive from one gardening season to the next. Um, and it's possible, um, and I'm going to share a few tips if you are interested in trying it. So on the left hand side, are pictures of some purple carrots at the top and some rutabagas at the bottom. I grew both of these crops last year in my garden. Um, the rutabagas were in the garden all summer long, and these were three of the last ones that were left in the garden in the fall. The carrots I had sown as a late season uh, planting, planted them in late July, and then harvested these in um, I believe early October. So I took these plants and I cut off most of the leaves, making sure that I did not damage just the very tip of the plant, the crown of the plant where the leaves actually emerge. And then I packed these um, plants without washing them into a cooler, just a standard picnic cooler. Um, I separated them so they weren't touching each other. I layered them with um, wood shavings, uh, very sterile, straight out of the plastic bag from the pet store wood shavings, and put them in the cooler in my garage. Shut. The cooler was shut. And I only uh, once during the winter, I took them out in January because I was dying to know what was going on in there. Um, I did find one carrot and one rutabaga that were starting to show some signs of rotting. But all of these that you see in the picture were in perfect condition. They were hard as rocks. There was no wilting, no uh, loss of water. There were no soft spots. Um, I repacked them into the cooler, put them back in the garage and left them there until this picture was, these pictures were taken on April 4th. So this is one way that you can overwinter a biennial crop by packing them into a cooler and making sure the cooler is in a place that is cold during the winter, but that will not freeze. Um, during the really, really cold spell um, we had for a couple of weeks, I did bring the cooler into the basement of my house just to be sure that nothing froze. And then as soon as that really cold spell was over, I put it back outside. And then um, I went ahead in April and I planted these back into my garden. And that's what you're seeing over on the right hand side. Um, these two pictures were taken this morning in my garden. So the, the rutabaga is clearly growing leaves again. And the carrot is also growing very nicely. Um, and these now will um, go to seed. They will both send up stalks, they will grow flowers, and they will grow seed. And that will uh, complete their life cycle. And I should have both of them produce copious amounts of seed. So I should have plenty of seed uh, for many years and plenty of seed to share. So there are probably Quite a few other ways that you can attempt to overwinter um, biennials, um, but that particular method worked very well for me um, for these particular crops that are small enough to fit comfortably into a cooler. So you might want to give that a try. So a couple of tips for you as beginning seed savers. Um, if you want to give this a try this year, I would strongly encourage you to start with just one or two different varieties that you're going to try to save seed from. Um, don't overwhelm yourself. Um, start off slow and, and succeed at it. And then, you know, you can try additional things in the coming years. Um, but probably pick something from that easy list that we looked at and, and go from there. Um, and then after you've grown your seeds, um, and just as an aside, we do have additional classes that talk more about how to harvest your seeds and the processing that some seeds require. Um, 
to, to get them ready for storage. We're not going to go into that here today, but we do have um, information like that on the speed, speed library website. Um, so you can look there for that. Um, but after you have saved your seeds, they're dried, they're stored away. Sometime during the winter, do a germination test. And all that means is take out about 10 seeds and layer them into a wet or damp uh, paper towel. I usually slide that paper towel into a Ziploc baggie and um, not shut it. Don't want it to be without air. I leave it open, but just inside a Ziploc baggie so that the paper towel doesn't dry out. And keep that really moist and then check those seeds um, in three to four days and just take a peek and see what they're doing. These seeds here in the picture, I believe they were cucumber seeds. They may have been melon seeds, I can't recall. Um, and I think I took this picture after three or four days and they were already clearly sprouting very strong roots in most cases. Um, in this case, um, there are a couple of them that I don't see roots really clearly yet. So what I would do is just fold them back up, stick them back in that bag, give it another couple days and see if those do end up sprouting as well. And this is going to give you a really good idea about the viability of your seeds. Um, if eight out of 10 germinate using this method, you've got 80% germination. That's incredible. Um, if you get five out of 10, you've got 50% germination. Even if you get a low germination rate, that doesn't mean that that was a failure. Just plan on planting more seeds the next year so that you can get enough that germinate. Um, so if you were going to plant a hill of squash and you would normally put five or six seeds in that hill, maybe you put eight to 10. And out of that eight to 10 seeds, you know you're going to get three or four that will germinate. So that's a really good way to know how good your seeds are before you start planting them into the ground. When, you know, if you wait, it might be too late to start over at that point. Um, and find really good resources and, and do additional research. Um, I love Seed Savers Exchange website. I've listed it there for you. They have an amazing amount of information on their website. They have growing guides and seed saving guides for everything you can possibly imagine. Um, of course, we also have um, lots of information on the seed library website. We have brochures for every variety that we offer for checkout and other um, resources on the seed library website for you to learn about how to save seeds. Um, and there are great books at the library, including um, the book called The Seed Garden, which is an extensive research resource put together by Seed Savers Exchange. And um, it's, it's my go-to book on seed saving, but there are many others as well. So I know I have given you a lot of information tonight. Um, I hope it's not overwhelming. I just want to give you the main takeaways and reiterate what I think are really the main points tonight. Um, and number one would be, again, to know the Latin names of the plants that you are growing because it's so frustrating to get to the end of the growing season thinking you've done everything right, and then all of a sudden realize, oh, my pumpkin may be crossed with my zucchini, and now I don't know if my seeds are gonna grow something I want. You know, that's frustrating. So know upfront what it is that you've got so that you can identify where any potential cross-pollination issues might be. And if you are growing just one variety of a species, don't worry. You're not going to have to worry about cross pollination. You just let nature take its course. Um, I know I talked about a lot of different interventions, from spacing to bagging to, you know, doing all sorts of things. But again, main point to remember is if you're growing only one variety, 
of pepper or one variety of squash or one variety of cucumber. You don't have to worry about any of that because you're not gonna have cross pollination issues. So that, that's a really the easy way to go. But if you're growing more than one variety, then take your precautions to make sure that you get true seed. Um, if what you want is you know, what you're growing in your garden and you wanna replicate that, you've gotta make sure that you're not um, allowing any cross pollination in your garden. Think about spacing. Think about timing in terms of how long the plant needs to be in your garden. Think about how many plants of a particular variety you might want to have what kind of population size. Those are all the different things you're going to consider as you're planning out where you're going to put these things in your garden to be the most successful at seed saving. And really, it is easy and it is fun and I know you can do this. So I encourage you to give it a try. I wanted to throw in a picture of our wonderful seed library. Um, I hope that you all have been there. Um, you can actually go in person now. The library is open Thursdays through Sundays, certain hours. And you can go up to the seed library and check it out for yourself. Um, it looks very much like this with the seeds that you um, limited to 10 seed packets there in the big rack on the left. And then in the old card catalog are other uh, community donated seeds that you can help yourself to. There's no limit on those. And then over on the far right are all the brochures that we've put together with helpful information on how to grow the plants and how to save those seeds. And that information is also on the website. And I also want to um, let you know that if you are interested in gardening and seed saving and maybe other forms of, of you know, self-sufficiency um, or sustainable lifestyle, you might be interested in joining um, our meetup group. This is just local folks who um, have this interest in common. And we do um, online events during the pandemic. I'm hoping to soon go back to some in person events for the summer. And we just have a lot of fun. So check us out um, by Googling for our name or going to meetup.com. And um, I hope you want to join us. And that is it. Um, for my presentation. Um, if I can stop sharing here. Stop sharing. Oh. So, um, any questions that I can answer on any seed saving topics? Um, anything at all that you're unclear about? more information. I've un tried to unmute everybody. It looks like it requests you to unmute yourself if you've been muted and want to talk and ask a question. Otherwise, the chat is open as well. I'm curious to know if anyone here has done any seed saving. Anyone willing to admit that they've done any seed saving? You have. What have you saved seed from? Are you willing to share? I tried to save some peas last year, but I left them outside and they got soggy. Okay. Yep. Yep. That is... Um, that can be a tricky um, decision. You know, how long do I leave them out till they get dry enough, but then, you know, get them in before big rains or, you know, other adverse weather conditions. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I've done a lot of seed saving with mostly flowers, um, zinnias, marigolds, but I also did um, some things that I got from the seed saving library last year. Except oh, I ran gosh. out of bok choy, so I had to go buy some. Oh. <laughs> That's wonderful. So did did it go pretty well for you? I think so. 
I tried starting some things in um, gallon jugs about two weeks ago, but unfortunately the sun hasn't done much since then. So I don't yeah. have too many sprouts, but everything that I planted in my cold frame is coming up. Wonderful. And are some of those your own seeds that you saved? Uh, lettuce seeds from last year, the carrot seeds I bought, and the box was from the seed library. Excellent. Wonderful. Good. Anybody with questions? I have a... Uh... An example of, I have an example of seed saving going that went wrong. Um, okay. Growing up, my parents had a very large garden, and we would grow a lot of different squash varieties. And um, every year, we would have volunteer plants that we said, "Oh, you know, this is a squash. We're going to save this." And um, one year, it was very unfortunate. We had a couple that cross pollinated, and it. I don't remember exactly what it looked like, but it was one squash on the outside and another squash on the inside with another squash's texture. And it, it was yeah. the absolute worst. It was yeah. bitter and be very careful with squash is the takeaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you could get lucky and get something really awesome, but there's also probably a better chance that you'll get something um, that is no good whatsoever. I had um, a volunteer come out of my compost pile last summer. I think the seeds were from a hybrid because my parents bring their food scraps over for my compost pile. And I, and I have a feeling it was a seed from something they had purchased in the store. And I knew it was a squash plant, but I didn't know what it was. And just simply as an experiment, I put it into a pot to see what would happen. And the plant looked like a zucchini plant in that it was kind of a bush form. But the fruit was white and round like a white pumpkin. It was bizarre. Um, and I didn't even I didn't even try it. I didn't eat it, but it, you know, it's just really interesting to see what happens when you take seeds <clears throat> either that cross in your garden or seeds from a hybrid plant and see what you get from it. And um, you know, if you've been waiting all season long for something you thought was going to be a good squash and then you get that. Um, that's really frustrating. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else? Did everyone find uh, one of their favorites on the easy list that they're willing and excited to try? I hope you will try something this year. Um, generally, you know, you're still going to get um, the vegetable that you grow it for, um, and then you're going to get, you know, something something extra on top of that. So it's it's a lot of fun. Well, with that, um, then if there are no questions, I don't want to take up any more of your evening. I thank you for being with us tonight. And um, just again, a reminder that if you, you know, forgot something or you want to go back and review any of this information, this, this video will be posted on the Sea Library website along with, with other good information. So um, I wish you the best in your gardening adventures and, and your seed saving adventures. Oh, I want to put in one plug too. that tomato talk. Do you want to mention tomato talk? Sure, if you can help me with the date um, this summer, we are doing a series of little chats um, with folks that want to kind of um, work together to grow tomatoes. Um, so each month we're going to meet, I think, is it the 3rd Wednesday, Carrie, the May 19th, maybe? Um, let me look at the calendar. Martha, do you remember? Yes. Yeah, no. May 19th at 7 o'clock, I think. Mm -hmm. So just a half an hour with Heidi talking about tomatoes. Right. We're going to talk about planting our tomatoes, um, trellising, um, that kind of thing in May. We'll meet in June. We'll meet in July and probably in August and just talk about 
um, all sorts of things related to growing tomatoes and then saving the seeds from those tomatoes and what you need to do um, before you store them away. So just trying to um, encourage folks on one of the more popular garden plants and um, make sure they can get seeds from their tomatoes and, and possibly contribute to the seed library as well. So information about that is out on the website, but it will be the third Wednesday of each month at seven o'clock. Thanks for helping us remember that, Carrie. Yeah, thanks, Martha, too. Yeah, thanks, Martha. And thank you, Kayla. This is a very comprehensive and great introduction to saving seeds. <laughs>